Hey church, it's Pastor Aaron and it's Wednesday and so we are back here ready to dive into God's Word uh, together here at this midweek moment. Uh, and so if you have a copy of Scripture, we're going to be hanging out in the same passage that we've been looking at the previous two Wednesdays, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, where this, this evening we'll look at the third commandment given there for everyone who is a believer, a pathway to discipleship, if you will. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, be turning there in your copy of Scripture if you have one in front of you. Uh, as you're turning there, let me give you an update on what's uh, going on. On Monday of this week, our governor released a statement uh, which was some guidelines for churches to consider as they begin prayerfully looking at the moment when they open their doors back up, begin to offer at least, an opportunity for you to return when you feel comfortable. And so we have those guidelines now in hand. We also uh, are going to be uh, prayerfully meeting this evening. As many of you are even watching this video, I will be meeting with our deacon body. And we will be discussing how to implement those plans in our context here at First Baptist in Flippin. And tomorrow I will be releasing some details about um, how, what that looks like and how you might be able to attend uh, or what options you'll have to attend when you feel the time is right. And so uh, be looking for that in this same format as early as less than 24 hours from now. Uh, I just wanted to kind of give you an update so we can keep this line of communication open. But for now, we're going to dive into Scripture together. So look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, tonight we're going to look at the third of three commands here given for uh, believers in how we are to relate to God. Uh, I had a seminary professor that said that this is a pretty good uh, short synopsis of what the life of a believer is to look like. Uh, three different commands, each succeeding one, one word more than the previous one, um, and each of them basically taking a whole lifetime to be able uh, to, to master and so we learned two weeks ago, the first command was to rejoice always at all times in all things during life that we as believers not necessarily are to be happy, but to, to live a life of settled confidence, of joy in the one who holds our life and future in his hands. That we have uh, a, a loving father with all resource and power and knowledge and wisdom at his disposal that is working, manipulating everything for our good. And so to rejoice always. Always. A second command that we looked at last week was to pray without ceasing. Not, not only are, do we live, uh, are we to live a life of, of continual joy, but we're also to live a life of continual communication with God in prayer. That doesn't always have to look formal. We don't have to be in a monastery. We don't have to have uh, the formalities of uh, dear Heavenly Father and in Jesus' name, amen. It can be a conversation that's going on uh, throughout the day with God. Uh, sometimes just a simple sentence, you know. Uh, God, help me uh, in this. God, pro you know, provide for me, protect me. Uh, God, be with so-and-so. Um, give me the words right now to minister in this circumstance. And so being in constant communion and relationship and, and conversation with God. And then today we come to the third uh, of these commands. And that is, in everything, give thanks. So we had a two-word command, rejoice always. Then we had a three-word command, pray without ceasing. And now we have the four-word command, in everything, give thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. And then it concludes this little section with a summary statement, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Uh, that's not just relating to the last command and everything give thanks. It's relating to all three. This is how God would have you to live if you call yourself a follower, a disciple um, of Jesus Christ. So that's God's will for us, that we have a duty, that we have an obligation to live a life of thanksgiving. Uh, of gratitude. In fact, in Romans chapter 1, where it talks about the unregenerate, those that are not saved, it says in verse 21 of Romans 1 that one of the characteristics of the people who don't know Christ as Savior is, is that they, they fail, they neglect to honor Him or give Him thanks. So the unsaved are ungrateful. They're unthankful, particularly towards God. And so we run into a passage like Jesus who gives a story in Luke chapter 7. We dealt with it a few months back. Uh, but in Luke chapter 7, uh, there's this, this story that Jesus tells about healing 10 lepers. 
And he says that in the story that uh, that after he he heals these ten lepers, that they all leave and they and they're they're headed to the to the temple to present themselves as clean so they can basically enter back into society. And only one of them thinks to turn around and come back and to say thanks. To give the proper thankfulness and gratitude there to Jesus Christ. And that is the one who received not only physical healing, but the salvation of his soul. And so scripture describes uh, that more people than not are like the nine. Uh, they, they're not grati- grateful and don't have gratitude towards God. They don't give God thanks. Uh, we're to be very different from that. In the Old Testament, um, God tells us that we're to be grateful uh, as well as in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, we obviously know that the, the sacrificial system was still in place and that there was animals that were sacrificed as sin offerings. But one of the things that you uh, probably remember as well is, is that in, in place also in the Old Testament were different kind of offerings than sin offerings. They had peace offerings and thank offerings. You can find these described in the book of Leviticus, uh, particularly there in chapter 7, that we are to give these uh, offerings, if we were Old Testament Jewish people, that they gave these offerings continually to God to show Him gratitude and thankfulness for not only meeting their physical, but also their spiritual needs. So we don't have that sacrificial system in place anymore. Uh, But I do not think that God has uh, called us to lose that attitude, that disposition of gratitude and thankfulness. In fact, he he makes it very clear uh, in the New Testament as well that we are to maintain uh, that in our life. And so here we see verse 18, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in everything give thanks. The idea there is, is that Uh, No matter what comes along in life, it has no limits, it has no confines, uh, no matter what it might be, we ought to give thanks. And so, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says that in the end times, this is a passage that many of you are familiar with, that there are going to be people who... Uh, are lovers of self and lovers of money and boastful and arrogant and revilers and disobedient to parents. And then it says this, they'll be ungrateful and unloving and unholy and irreconcilable. And that list goes on and on there. But it says that these people, they, they hold to a form of godliness, but they deny its power. These, these people act like they're believers, but that they're not. And one of the things that it, it kind of reveals their heart and uh, the fact that they're pretenders, if you will, is their ungratefulness towards God. So if we're genuine, if we're believers, if we're a disciple of God and of Christ, then we're called to, to be grateful. The believer is to operate in a completely different realm than being a lover of self, lover of money, boastful, arrogant, reviler, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable. We are to rejoice at all times, to be thankful in every single thing. Now that, come, that comes with some difficulty in the hard moments of life. Julie, um, my wife, lost an aunt a few years back. Her grandmother, um, this aunt's mom, just passed away just a, a month or two ago. And some of you remember right before this pandemic started, we left and had to make a trip to Texas for her, her grandmother, her nanny's funeral. Um, but her nanny lost a, a daughter several years ago, right after Julie and I got married, uh, Julie's aunt. And, um, and her death was due to an, an overdose uh, of, of some medications. And that was even more difficult. And Julie's nanny was really struggling with the death of her daughter, as any parent would, right? And so as she was struggling and going through all those phases of grief and and anger and, and denial and in questioning and all those various things that some of you know all too familiar, um that she said that she went to sleep one night and that she had a dream that was as real as any dream that she's ever dreamed. And she said in it that God spoke to her. And it was about 
her grief. And she said, you know, God came and he quoted scripture to me. He quoted and he said, uh, Phoebe, that was her grandmother, her nanny's name. She said that I'm working all things together for the good of those who love me. That passage from Romans that all of us know. And she said that this was like a conversation with God. And she said, God, I, I don't see how there is any good in this. I don't see how there is any good that can come of this. And she said that God responded in that dream by saying, I am not a man that I should lie. And she said, Aaron, I, I knew that passage from Romans. I've heard it my whole life, that God's working all things together for the good of those who love him. But she's like, I, I had never heard that I am not a man that I should lie. But she said, I had the confidence uh, that that was in Scripture. So the next morning I got up and she said, surely enough, Romans 20, Romans, excuse me, Numbers 23 and verse 19 uh, was exactly that. I am not a man that I should lie. And so the believer operates with this thankfulness in our heart that that God's not a liar, that his promises are true and are reliable. And so Phoebe from that point on said that, uh, that her grief was far different uh, than what it was before, that God spoke to her in that dream and that uh, made it clear that even if you don't understand, that you can trust me because I'm not a God that lies. And so 2 Corinthians 4 verse 15 says this, For all things are for your sakes, that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. All things are for your sakes. Paul's saying this to the Corinthians who caused him a whole lot of headaches uh, if you read the book. But all things are for your sakes that the grace which is spreading to more and more people, more and more people are finding Jesus and that it might cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. That the ultimate, the end there is to give thanks and glory uh, to God the Father there. Second Corinthians 9 in verse 10 and 11. Turn there with me in your copy of Scripture. Second Corinthians chapter 9. See if I can get there. Second Corinthians 9 verses 10 and 11 say this. It says, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for the sowing and increase the harvest for your righteousness. And you will be enriched in everything for all liberally, uh, which through us produces thanksgiving to God. And so God is going to supply your need. And in fact, he's going to go over and above that. He's going to supply to you abundantly. Why? In order to bring us to the point of thanksgiving. So that's what that passage is talking about. And then over in the book of Ephesians, there's a similar passage. Again, the end of all of these are living a life of thanks and gratitude. In Ephesians 5 and verses 3 and following, But immorality nor impurity or greed must not even be named among you as it is proper uh, among saints. There must be no filthiness or silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. So, so Paul here is talking to the believers in Ephesus, and he's basically telling them the same thing as he did the Corinthians. He's saying, hey, listen, uh, all these things, all these immoral things are not to be fitting of you. What is to be said of you is that you are a person who displays gratitude and thankfulness towards uh, Jesus Christ uh, in your relationship with God. And so to live the righteous life means to live a life of gratitude. And so... Philippians 4 in verse 6, uh, what, are we, what are we to say when, when life is difficult, like Phoebe's situation that we just talked about a minute ago, Julie's grandmother? Um, well, Paul says there uh, that many of you heard Brother Steve uh, preach on this on Sunday. Uh, that be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And so... We're not to let anxiety rule our life, but we're to go to God in prayer, as that second commandment told us to do, right? Uh, pray without ceasing. But we're to go to God in prayer with our concerns uh, and from a position of thanksgiving and gratitude and let those requests be made to, known to God. Second, uh, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. As, therefore, uh, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. 
So we're to walk daily in our, our life with God. And so this is talking to believers in Colossians. And so listen to this. As therefore you've received Christ Jesus, so walk with him. Be in a daily relationship with him. So now that you have received Christ Jesus, pattern your life after him. And then in verse 7 it says, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him. Uh, so we, we there was a moment where we take root as believers. We establish that foundation in Christ. But now that we have the roots, we're beginning to grow uh, in stature. That's that point of sanctification, of discipleship. Um, and so it says here that we are established in our faith just as we are instructed and overflowing with gratitude. As you begin to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ, as you begin to commune with him in this daily matter, as you uh, exude a life of joy, as you spend time with God in a life of prayer and communication, it, you can't help but your life overflowing in gratitude towards him. And so a verse that kind of sums this up is in John 11 and verse 41. And this is Jesus. All right. We're talking about, man, what do you do? How can, Pastor, how can you really have a life of uh, a constant gratitude and thankfulness when things are tough? Because, man, things are tough right now. I didn't expect this virus. Uh, my job is my job is not even promised now. I'm on furlough, and I, I don't know if I'm going to have one when I come when everything comes back. Uh, uh, God, things have been difficult for me financially. They're certainly difficult for me in my in my home. Sometimes uh, life's just not all roses. And so, how can you say that I'm to be grateful and thankful at all times? And listen to this in John 11 and verse 41. Uh, in fact, turn there. I want you to see the context of this. John 11 in verse 41. What you'll notice is that this passage uh, is written uh, in the same story or narrative as Jesus responding to the death of his friend Lazarus. And so here uh, he's praying. He gets to the tomb of Lazarus and he's wept. And now he's sitting there outside of the tomb and he begins to pray. And it says here, so uh, they removed the stone and Jesus raised his eyes and he said, Father, I thank you. This gratitude. I thank you that you, ha you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people I stand around and I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. And so Jesus here is standing at, um, standing at the friend, his, one of his very, very best earthly friends, um, grave. And he's saying, Father, I thank you. Um, and so we see here, it's not just an attitude or a disposition of gratitude in moments when uh, things are well. It's even when they're not well. Another perfect example of that would be at the Last Supper when Jesus um, is, is praying. And it says that uh, he took the bread from the Last Supper and he broke it and he gave thanks, right? Um, he sits there and he, and he gives thanks as he breaks the bread, and it's described in that passage as the bread is symbolizing what? They're sending, symbolizing his body that is broke for you. And so Jesus is giving thanks even as he is uh, symbolically portraying what he knows to be uh, a reality in the coming uh, moments after that where his, his body is going to be given as a sacrifice. So Jesus' thankfulness is not limited to uh, the time when it is uh, all well in life. It's it's even there and present when things are not well. And and he calls us to do likewise. And so, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, is what our passage says there in First Thessalonians chapter 5. So, what hinders us from being uh, a, a grateful or a thankful believer, as God calls us to? Um, the first thing I think that could be a hindrance to, to being a, a grateful person in in Christ is um, is doubt about God, and uh, this is more present in our life than we would care to admit. Uh, that we doubt uh, God's promises, and maybe maybe God's promised that to somebody else, but surely that doesn't apply to me. Maybe we doubt God's wisdom. Man, God, I know that you might have thought this should be this would be the best for me, but this path is is really way too hard and. Um, and it, it, this is not what's best. We doubt God's goodness. We doubt God's word. We doubt God's promises. We doubt God's um, his immutability, that he's, he's, he's changeless, that he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so we say, yeah, I know that God has worked historically in this fashion, but maybe he's changed the rules and he's pulled the rug out from, from under me. And so we doubt God and we doubt his power. Yeah, God, I know that, I know that you can 
part the sea. And God, I know that you can raise the dead, as in Lazarus that we just talked about, but you know, you're not you're not capable of saving my marriage. You're not capable of of changing my heart or rescuing my kids from from this circumstance or that circumstance. And so we begin to uh, not vocalize, but express uh, through our heart uh, doubt in God's um, goodness. And uh, and so we, we begin to do that in our life and it affects that attitude of, of thankfulness um, that we don't believe God can overrule the problems of our life. A second uh, thing that I think stands or hinders us from living a life of gratitude would be our own selfishness. Uh, I, I mentioned a minute ago that Jesus uh, displayed uh, a perfect model for us and being able to be grateful even in less than ideal circumstances, right? And most of life for us is spent in less than ideal circumstances. And so we're to mimic what we've seen in Jesus. But one of the things that uh, that we often don't mimic that leads Jesus to be able to be grateful and thankful is, is that he's able to pray, uh, you know, God, if you're willing, remove this cup from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And so we're we're prone to selfishness where we can't pray as Jesus did, not my will, but yours be done, because we want my will to be done. Uh, and I, I've never got to the point where I'm OK with saying, hey, listen, if my will's not best for me, then 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 have your way, God. And that's exactly where Jesus was operating from. And so uh, we can be selfish. Um, David in Psalm 16 says, I have set the Lord always before me. Therefore, my heart is glad. It's thankful and my glory rejoices. Uh, that's what we have to be in order to have this attitude or disposition of thankfulness. We have to continually set God before us, uh, continually be saying, God, I want to commune with you. I want relationship with you. I want to pray to you. I'm going to cast my anxiety to you and let you take those things upon your shoulders because they're far too heavy for me. And when I can do those and when you remove that weight, I can live a life of gratitude and thankfulness. And so uh, whether it be selfishness, whether it be doubt, another thing I think is a critical spirit. Some of us are far too critical. Um, if you're not like that, you, I certainly know that you would be able to um, identify with people that are critical. They're negative, they're bitter, uh, they're sour in their attitude towards life. And when that kind of um, stuff goes unchecked in our life, it destroys a grateful heart. It destroys thankfulness. Uh, in fact, it destroys relationships, period. Nobody wants to be around a person who is continually negative and bitter and sour. And so uh, that will rob you of your, your opportunity to live that life of gratitude. Um, also, impatience can rob us of this attitude of, of, of gratefulness. Um, this is that we, we're told in Scripture that God's ways are not our ways and His thoughts are not our our thoughts, and I would also say that his timeline is not our timeline. You know, we say in Scripture that uh, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. And so, um, man, we're we're uh, we're oftentimes in a rush for God to respond uh, to the the moment uh, in our life, and God sometimes doesn't do that. And and so, when we don't have a and the answer in this popcorn society that we live in, that we want to immediately uh, be um, be answered, this microwavable ment mentality that we should just be able to go and nuke something and, and it be ready for us. And when God doesn't operate that way, uh, we, we lose our patience. And when we lose our patience, sometimes we lose uh, our, our gratitude to God. And so I think that uh, impatience can, can also be a hindrance to a life of gratitude. Certainly rebellion. Uh, some of us are just flat out rebellious, right? Um, we can critique young generation all we want, but in reality, if we're spiritually speaking, that some of us uh, have far exceeded our youth, and yet we're still living a life of rebellion, uh, not necessarily against our parents, but against our Heavenly Father. And um, we defy the direction and the will of God in our life. And uh, that, that will lead us to a life of ingratitude because we're continually bucking uh, his direction for us. Um, and so those are just a few of the things that I think begin to, to lead us away from a life of thankfulness. Um, we ought to be motivated towards gratitude because number one, that's what God called us to. And number two is that, is that God, uh, he's done so much for us. Some perspective is what helps us uh, to live that life of gratitude that, 
that God's character, uh, that he's holy, that he's perfect, that he is uh, wise, that he is incapable of making a wrong decision. He's incapable of making a mistake, that he's good and merciful. Uh, Psalms 107 verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. That God is eternal and that his love is limitless and his grace endures. And so be thankful for a divine guidance that we have scripture to hold on to. We have the promises of the Lord. And I trust in them. Um, right here in the middle of these verses, you know, that we are to uh, rejoice always and to give thanks. And so these are two things that we're called to right in the middle of that was that, that three word uh, pray without ceasing. And so I think these commands, uh, even though we're taking them in isolation from one another a bit as we dissect them, uh, they have to be kind of read together. And in order to live a life of joy at all times and gratitude and thankfulness at all times um, is really going to take a movement of God inside of us. I think we know that. Um, and so that pray without ceasing is kind of the, uh, the meat of the sandwich. It's what holds everything together. And, and when we begin to pray to God, He changes our heart attitudes. He changes our perspective. We're drawn closer to Him, and we grow in confidence of His promises and of the future outcomes. And so uh, pray without ceasing is perhaps the key to living a life of continual joy and a life of gratitude and thankfulness. Um, and so that's my encouragement for you for this evening. Uh, just spend some time in those three. If you want to be praying about how to grow in Christ, I would recommend just uh, fixating on these two, three, and four word commands. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for that's God's will for you if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. And so, man, I miss you, church. I look forward to giving you an announcement uh, very soon about the next time that we can be together. So be in prayer for us tonight as we meet, and I will talk to you soon. Let's say a word of prayer, and we're out. God, I love you. I thank you for an opportunity to meet uh, today again digitally. It's been a few moments here in your word. I just pray for my brothers and sisters. Uh, man, I miss them, God. And yet I know that uh, even as, uh, as we've already discussed this evening, that you're working all things together for our good. And so uh, while we sometimes can't see that in this moment, God, I pray that even things like uh, these words going out digitally for the whole world to see, and God has been a blessing where you've drawn some to yourself, where you've, where you've worked in people's life, where they've grown in their trust and their faith in you during the season of, of uncertainty in our society. And so uh, give us wisdom and uh, discernment about when and how to meet. And God, give each person as they consider uh, um, the different uh, feelings that they're experiencing, uh, give them discernment about when, when they need to come back, even if the doors are open. Uh, it may not be that you uh, give them the peace about being back here. And so may we all be understanding, loving, and caring, and accepting uh, of one another in this season. And um, God, may we ultimately be grateful uh, for the great work that you've done for us through Christ, his death, resurrection, ascension, and coming uh, return. And so we thank you for Christ, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. We'll see you soon, church.